Welcome you in this RWB session in the Qasimi meeting. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to, to introduce uh, our uh, valuable speaker, Dr. Arfan. He will be uh, with us, pediatric consultant from uh, Sheikh Khalifa Abu Dhabi. Uh, and also we have, it will join us later, Dr. Amaria Malfiki. She is associate consultant in Ain Shams University, uh, Egypt. And also we have an, uh, a recorded presentation, sadly, Dr. Peter Campbell. He is an associate professor in Oregon University. He can't join us live, so he will be. He will send his recorded. Uh, we have his recorded uh, lecture will be with us. So I think, Dr. Arfan, you can begin your lecture. Okay. Let me share my screen. Yeah. All right. Hassan, uh, can you see my slides? And here we are. Okay, everybody, yes, can uh, Hassan, can you, see, can you see them? I can see it. Okay, good. All right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for asking uh, for this uh, 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 honor. And uh, thank you very much again, Hassan. Uh, since, uh, he's a good friend and I, I deeply, uh, 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 it's always nice to hear Hassan, uh, from Hassan. So I'm going to talk about uh, retinopathy of prematurity and laser uh, and anti-VEGF. So uh, as a part of SKMC, we uh, uh, do screening for ROP in uh, Cornish Hospital. It's it's a quite a busy unit. It's about an 85 bed unit. And uh, we screen about uh, almost uh, more than 800 cases a year. And we treat roughly between 32 and 40 cases a year. So I'm going to start straight into uh, clinical cases. So this is a case uh, in uh, yeah. So this is a case uh, which who was a 24 weeker, 670 grams, and he was seen at 34 weeks. At uh, this time, he is in uh, vessels are in zone two. Uh, he has a significant stage two in both eyes. He has a plus and P plus in both the eyes. And at this point, we decided that we're going to go into do an anti vegf for him. This is his uh, uh, retinal pictures. Uh, a lot of plus disease, a uh, uh, good bit of stage over here. Again, uh, uh, the left eye is more worse than the uh, other eye. So he was injected with anti vegf and this is now uh, uh, 34 weeks, just a few days. So he had a good response with the anti vegf Those who do anti vegf uh, within 24 hours, you can see a uh, uh, incredible difference. So moving on, the patient is now four weeks uh, post anti vegf He is now 38 weeks. He uh, still has some hemorrhages uh, coming up. There's some uh, recurrence uh, coming here nasally uh, in both the sides. Temporally, he's still all right. He still has thin retinal blood vessels. Now, uh, moving on to eight weeks, now he's developed more tufts of NVEs at the edge of the vascular and the non-vascular area in both the eyes. There's a bit of P plus coming here. He's now 42 weeks, and this is eight weeks post anti vegf So at this stage, uh, he underwent uh, laser. So he was uh, booked up uh, uh, for laser at SKMC. Uh, so this is what, uh, this is eight weeks post anti vegf Now looking at the second case, this is again a 23-weeker, 500 grams. Uh, zone one and zone two, stage uh, two with uh, pre plus. Uh, pictures are uh, not the best, but it's because the vitreous was quite hazy. If you look, the blood vessels are very tortuous here. He's a bit of an edge here coming here. Uh, and uh, nasally, it, it, it is more as compared to the temporal sign over here. There's some area of uh, between stage two. Uh, cannot see if there's any NVEs, but looks as if he will progress to it. So he was uh, uh, opted for anti-VEGF and anti-VEGF was given and uh, at this stage. Now moving on, he is now the same case. He is now uh, 42 weeks now and 42 weeks and uh, now he's developed uh, recurrence, uh, significant uh, disease over here in the temple. A lot of uh, NVEs, a lot of elevation there. A posterior port doesn't look that bad, but uh, temporarily there was a significant disease. So this patient then underwent uh, laser after that. So uh, recurrence after anti vegf In our experience, babies receiving Lucentis, the recurrence of RP is seen after five weeks. We I generally tend to avoid the second anti vegf because I'm always scared about the uh, 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 the systemic side effects that we don't know of as yet. 
so and and the other thing is that if the vessels are midway in zone two or zone three, and they've passed the zone two and just entering the uh, entering then uh, uh, zone uh, three, we stage three we uh, are kind of offered a laser as a first line uh, treatment. Uh, this is uh, as in this case. This uh, baby was a 26 weeker, 790 grams. Now 37 week, and uh, uh, some tortuosity over here. The, the more in the periphery it is developing some uh, NVEs. The blood vessels are branching, so we opted for laser finish off the disease once and for all instead of uh, seeing the patient again. Uh, case number four. Uh, this is a, an, an interesting case. Uh, a 27 weeker, 800 gram. He received anti VEGF quite late at around 40 weeks, just before he uh, the baby was about to discharge. This is quite a long, uh, about a while ago, about three, four years ago, when the baby was seen. So when I saw the baby, the baby had a very large, a very large fibrous ridge here temporally. The other eye was fine, and there was also some straightening of the blood vessels here. There was a, uh, this area was all empty. So I opted for laser uh, all at the uh, avascular retina. And uh, as a prophylactic, she also had underwent a scleral buckle just in that eye. Um, please to say that I'm still seeing her for now and she uh, is the retina is flat and uh, she is doing really well. Uh, case uh, five is a twin, 26 weeker, 850 grams. And uh, so posterior pole looks good, and uh, but at the periphery there's a large avascular area. Uh, again, uh, she uh, kept we uh, kept on monitoring her, and now at 45 weeks, then she develops a more like a vitreo retinal tuft uh, with some end, uh, with some uh, like a fibrous uh, proliferation over here and uh, some elevation of the blood vessels. So at this stage, uh, she underwent laser. Sometimes if I see some some of these cases, I do uh, sometimes laser anterior to the area, just uh, in, a, in a fair up if this, they develop some, some traction or fibrosis, I don't I want some kind of uh, uh, strengthening effect here, just anterior to the fibrovascular uh, area. Uh, so, so far, anti is, uh intervention is better if, if it's done earlier. I offer laser if vessels they pass beyond anterior uh, zone three. And if anti VEGF is done, then job is not done. You still have to look for recurrence, very, very important. And delayed vascularization, large avascular zones, you have to always look for signs of NVEs and you have to laser them. Uh, move, about the delayed vascularization, this is a case which, uh, again, not to uh, pass on the video. She is now uh, three years of age. She was a, a, a quite a young individual and uh, she came to me that uh, uh, that should we do anything or not? But this is a fundus fluorescein angiogram which we did, and look, she it's uh, this uh, it's just completely a vascular. There is no NVEs, nothing at all. So strangely, I haven't done anything to her as yet. I'm just following her. She she is quite she is uh, about minus three minus four myopic, but so, uh, so far she hasn't developed any signs of uh, neovascularization. Uh, and uh, just to note, she she did not go. She did not underwent any uh, uh, treatment, uh, laser or antibiotic. Okay, so I just have to, uh, this is just a summary uh, for now on. So the current RP guidelines are good for low risk babies. Screening interval may have to be shortened. This is, I do that sometimes if I'm uh, a bit uh, concerned, I, I do see the babies earlier on. And this is other, also a very important point. If you don't do RP around every week, then it's better to familiarize, type, uh, familiarize yourself with the images. And American Academy has a very useful test uh, and, and it's a good tool uh, to do it. And also think about the safety profile uh, for your patients. Is that anti vegf or is it, is it uh, laser, whichever you are comfortable with. I just have two last cases to finish off then. This is a very interesting case because the patient, one of the, this is 33 weaker. Uh, this is the right eye, this is the left eye. And uh, she's a 23 weaker, 490 grams. Now 33, she she was she underwent anti vegf at 33 weeks, and then she, at eight weeks, uh, that's what we see. She developed uh, recurrence, and at that point, uh, she was booked for bilateral PRP. But uh, in the right eye, she underwent laser. In the left eye, we had an equipment failure, so we could not do anything. So because of the recurrence, I had to give her another anti vegf in the left eye. 
And this is her post laser, 2,500 uh, uh, shots posterior pole. This is the peripheries, uh, all laser done. And uh, this is the left eye uh, with only anti VEGF. Uh, posterior pole looks pretty much the same as the right eye. Uh, some peripheral neurovascularization of uh, some, sorry, uh, peripheral vascular changes over here. And over here, she has a, uh, a vas like a demarcation line. We're still following her. She is, uh, she still hasn't developed any NVEs, but uh, uh, I think probably has some said she may develop something and she may require a laser in this eye. Uh, so this is the right eye, which underwent uh, laser, and this is the left eye, which underwent two anti VEGFs. Uh, probably if you probably there's a little bit of more tortuosity in the in the left eye as compared to the right eye. One more case. This is a 20, uh, 28 weeker. It's the last case. 1300 grams and had one ROP screen done. The parents didn't like the ROP screen which was done, so they, they were worried about the speculum. So unfortunately, they did miss the screen. And when the baby came uh, to us, uh, she had a lot of hemorrhages. Uh, a large uh, hemorrhage over here, a lot of fibrosis over here, this large area of the retina elevating with, uh, uh, and also over here in the other eye, she has some uh, fibrotic changes over here with some uh, uh, vitreous and kind of uh, fibrous bands over here. Uh, uh, she was booked for laser. Uh, it was too risky to do an anti vegf over here, having this large fibrotic band. So she was lasered over here. Again, these cases I've got a bit worried. So I, I do uh, some uh, prophylactic laser just in uh, anterior to it. This is only in cases in which there's a very large fibrotic ridge. And uh, so it's similar to the other eye. And uh, this is her recently, everything is now settling down. She does have some vitreous uh, condensation, some vitreous bands over here, but there's no blood vessels here. Previously, there were uh, literally blood vessels coming up into the vitreous over here. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, the hemorrhages have all, have all played. And uh, she only underwent one session of laser and she's she's doing good now. Uh, so in summary, laser is my preferred choice. anti vegf does give uh, by some time, but uh, this is an article which came out uh, in, in editorial about uh, yeah, talking about uh, Bevacis and Mab and the, uh, for ROP and the neurodevelopment. So it is, it's a very important read and uh, it just gives us some insight that what happens uh, to these babies uh, in, in the future, do they develop some neurodevelopment uh, uh, problems or not. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, stop sharing here. Thank you, Dr. Khan, uh, for this valuable information and very good, uh, excellent cases. So just for us that for you are, we have you use the NTVGF in the zone one and you don't use it in the zone two and you go for the laser and the recurrence. So about the zone two posterior, do you are prefer the laser or you prefer the injection, the NTVGF to uh -huh. begin? I I would my my personal choice I would prefer the laser because I'm slightly worried about cases who especially don't have any insurance coverages so it's easier to and it's easier for me to bring the babies to SKMC so I bring them there and I finish off the laser and so at least even if they miss a follow up I'm not worried about any delayed recurrence with the anti vegf in spite of I mean, the UK guidelines, they mentioned that zone two posterior, they advise even to use the anti VGF because according to the ICROB 3, they mentioned the zone two posterior, even they give the definition for that, maybe they open the gate for to use the anti VGF in this zone because um, mostly the patient, if he underwent the laser in this zone, mostly he will end by high myopia, uh, huge uh, visual defect. Maybe if we can use, because that as zone one, uh, so what's your opinion? You prefer still you you use it if the patient is can do follow up with you? Do you prefer to so, go uh, laser or you can try for him on injection to avoid these refractive uh, maybe errors or uh, visual fields? I mean, because this is the debate these, around the, the real real life practicing. There's guidelines and there's some some I, most of the people they try to do the laser to finish the follow up, but this is it could be the solution for the children, especially when the patient is uh, between 45 weeks, 60 weeks. And generally here, when if you underwent the laser, mostly he will end by minus six, minus seven, minus eight sometimes. So mm -hmm. still there is, what's your, uh, what's your, what's your advice? My, my advice in these cases, I think, I think probably zone two, okay, maybe a yeah, zone two anterior, zone two posterior. I think I would wait like, the picture that I showed in which the baby was in uh, zone three and there was a, a some a vascularity area and there was a there's a, a there was a vitreoretinal like a fibrovascular ridge there. I mean, if the vessels go up to here, then definitely laser. 
But if and probably, yeah, in zone two, like mid zone two, or even probably if they're reaching anterior zone three, uh, yeah, I would, I, I would try an anti VEGF. My only problem if, if I, because again, it's, it's the recurrence and most of these cases and what I've seen with the vaccine, I end up with a very, with always with, uh, with a good a, like a vascular uh, area head. It's, and it's, and it's pretty, it's pretty much. And uh, yeah, I mean, I follow them up till about 45 weeks, but then again, after 45 weeks, then booking them up for EUAs and uh, it, it kind of, for, for me, it, it, it does cause some, some burden on, on my waiting list. So what, what I've recently done is that, yeah, I wait up to 45. If they still have an avascular area post anti vegf I laser them. And uh, yeah, primary laser procedures, anterior zone three, I would laser them and just uh, finish the job. Uh, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, we I haven't had many large myopias there. I've had minus minus three up to minus two so far, but uh, I haven't had a very oh, very large my, myopia. Why, why even we chose before we was using this one? The recurrence even we have it like in holy sentence. If there is recurrence, we are going to do the laser. But we review our literature. We have cases since maybe around eight years. So when we saw that the patient has ROB in the zone one or ROB, aggressive ROB, and he has recurrence, and we go for the laser, and mostly it will be the zone two posterior. Mostly the patient will be end by minus six, minus five. So we said for ourselves, why if the patient is in zone two posterior, still in zone one, we can give him another chance to do the laser, then he, the eye will be grow more. It will be Even if you do the laser for this zone after the baby's growth, the eye grow, Maybe at least you avoid some ischemia for the anterior segment. The anterior segment will be better growth. So you can avoid the, the high myopia in this situation, why I ask you. Another question just to come to my mind, because there's some, some questions. Which kind of uh, anti-VGF you use in your facility? We only use uh, any people's lucentis. If you have, if you have the access to the bifazumab, you can do it, or you would prefer to avoid it? I think I'd prefer to avoid it, especially with the with the neuro. I mean, I'm I'm not quite sure, but I still feel that even with the anti vegf which I give, I always see there's a bit of optic disc pallor, which I always which I've which I've realized is that most of the babies they get some kind of it, and I'm, I'm actually looking at up uh, our results in which some of the babies have ended up who are very very like premature, 23 weeker who had an anti vegf and then laser. I was looking at, uh, like, we have two twins. One of the twins did really bad, went a, a lot of neurodevelopmental delay, uh, and the other kid was kind of, like, perfectly fine. So, again, I'm not quite sure, is that is this the anti vegf or not? So, but, again, I think probably with a safety profile, I'll stick with uh, Rani Gilzamab. Let me, let, me let, let me then begin my lecture, to because the family will be the, late, the, the, the last on the list, and... Uh, and I'll try yeah. to explain something about maybe literature about this. I hope that it will be beneficial for the yeah. audience. Just let me share Looking my presentation. You can see my uh, yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm Dr. Hassan uh, from Dubai Hospital. Uh, we are consult the surgeon and consultant, and I'm responsible about the ROV service in, in Dubai Hospital in the, in the uh, DHA. Uh, there's no no financial disclosure. Uh, just understanding this, I like this slide, and I use it always. This uh, summarizes the the life of the of the ROV from the beginning until the eye crop, the classification of the uh, ROB, then the oral randomized control studies, which uh, uh, used to treat this disease from beginning from different modalities, uh, from cryo or from the laser, and uh, even beginning by the BIAT study, which used the bifazumab, then the care study, which uh, used two doses of ranibizumab, uh, ranibizumab, which compared the anti-VGF different doses by the laser, and then the ICROB3, which give us Huge definitions for something which deb we debate around it. And Firefly, which gives the approval for the flibercept to use in the ROB, and we are waiting the five years on Ibizumab extensions. Uh, understanding about the comparing between two modalities for laser or cryo, that they are looking after the better anatomical outcome and the laser approved better. Um, uh, when we are treating the ROB, generally we are looking for a better anatomical outcome, better visual function, 
considering that ROB has complica ophthalmic complication, but on the other side, there's developmental and neurological uh, complication for the prematurity itself. And in the end, when we treat and we use any medication or any treatment, we are, we are looking for less side effects, which we see sometimes the safety if we speak it. You speak about the medical treatment for the ROB. This means that we use the anti-VGF, which are valuable and now in the market and there is underwent randomized control trials. We have the basumab, ranibizumab, flibersib. And we compare it, the most important, we compare between the molecular weights and the bivas who have the highest and the ranibizumab the lowest and even the half-life because the half-life of the bivazumab is higher than the ranibizumab and the flibersib in between two these medications. Uh, understand that, put in your mind that these premature babies, they have premature, uh, immature uh, blood retinal barrier. This is mean that this is not like the adult's eye. So from, from pharmacokinetics, elimination from the eye is 50% faster in the premature eye than adult. And the other side, from the elimination from the serum, it's a threefold lower in the premature eye uh, comparing by the adult. This is mean that the medication will be less in the eye, but it will be, uh, it will be extended in the serum comparing by the others. From the rainbow study, which compare between two doses, and when they measure the free ranibizumab in the serum, they found that when you give the baby a 0.2 milligram injection, he has free ranibizumab 16-fold more than the adult who received 0.5 milligram in AMD. And the other side, when you uh, use half dose, 0 0.1, the, the baby has around sevenfold free run zumbab comparing by the adult who receives 0 0.5. So from this, you know that even when you use lower doses, still you are have more exposure for the, in the serum for this anti-VGF. Why we speak about this? Because these prematures, they have multi-organs still under growth, the brain, the lung, the kidneys, and we use this VGF suppression because this vascularization need in all these in the organs. So for that, they speak about the systemic effect for this medication is now is the main, the main part in the, all of the studies. So for that, if you go for the uh, BIET study, which investigate and compare between bifazumab and laser, and they use 625 microgram. How would they reach this? Because according to them, when they choose this, they, this dose, they, depending on the experimental uh, trials on the animal models, they found that this is the largest uh, molecular. So it will be escaped less uh, from the eye and uh, it, will be, uh, uh, it will be effective just inside the eye. But this is not in the real because the, according to the, the, the real life evidence, this is not uh, correct because the FASUMAB has systemic effect more than all of the others. Um, so even in this study, they found that the, the death rate in the anti-VGF group is higher than the laser. So if we go even to investigate the laser from the older study, because we have the ETROP, which compare between the cryo and the laser, this study, they did mention that if you do the laser earlier for these babies, you will have higher mortality compared by, by delay. This means that the laser still wasn't the reason for, at least from, from, this, from this study, when they compare that briefly showed baby who underwent uh, a prompt laser and who the other who conventional observed, they found that the mortality, the permanent morbidity between two groups, the same. This means the laser, the rate of the death in the laser wasn't mentioned before, but when the anti-VGF enter, then we face this problem. As Dr. Uh, Arfan mentioned about the tutorials, what mentioned about wrong dose, wrong we, we maybe this is affect the normal vascularization for the retina and for the others. So, even the evidence came that when you use the anti -VG, the bifazumab, you suppress the VGF in the blood in the serum from eight to 12 weeks. This is have potential systemic and neurodevelopmental effect for this anti-VGF and the ROB treatment. Reviewing all of the data, if you go to review this meta-analysis for the, about the neurodevelopmental uh, impairment for these baby who underwent the anti-VGF compared with the laser, they found that there is increase in the risk of the cognitive impairment. But on the other side, there is even meta-analysis and reports, they found that there is no risk for severe neurodevelopmental impairment, in spite it could be some minor difference in motor performance. So still the profile for bifazumab in this dose is still debate. So, 
if we go back to the Bieta study, we have some follow-up for this one of the sites which we use the, the Bifazumab, and they look after the neurodevelopment, so they don't found any difference between the two groups. But in spite of still the more around the world, somebody's uh, afraid from this kind of dose. So in the pediatric eye disease investigation uh, group, they used low doses and very low doses. They reached the four microgram of uh, Vastin and they found effective, but the, when they reduced the doses, they found that in the very low doses, you have reactivation earlier because in the bifazumab, generally the reactivation come after eight to 10 weeks when the, with the half dose of the adults. But when you reduce the doses, you will have reactivation earlier, but the recurrence not related to the dose. If we go for further by the ranibizumab study, this is compared between two doses with the 0.1 considered 20% from the adult dose and uh, 0.2 is 40% from the adult dose. They found there's systemic effect for this medication is, is the, uh, around the same in the VGF suppression and the efficacy is, was the same. But they mentioned that there is kind of evidence that could using the low dose could have complete vascularization, but this is, wasn't clinical significant. And we have another evidence from the rainbow study, which approve again is this. So the rainbow study, this is, I think, the most important study in the now between our hands, because this is compared between two doses and the laser. And through this study, they approved that the severity of 0.2 milligram to the laser, but there wasn't clinical significant between the two doses of the anti-VG of 0.2 or 0.1. And about the safety of the systemic effect, the VEGF suppression continue until one month and both doses around the same. Even here, if you go for the ranibizumab uh, free, you found that after one, uh, there is reduced from around seven fo uh, fold uh, reduction in the concentration of the ranibizumab from the first day to the last day. And you can, you find that even if you use lower dose still, there's, you, you'll find traces of ranibizumab. And uh, when you increase the dose, you will have increased the free uh, particle of these medications. Again, the VGF, the free VGF between these three modalities. And we have the extension when the result for two years for this study, which approved that the good result, which was available in the first primary outcome is continue. Reactivation in both doses is the same, 30%. Peripheral vascular area is 30% in the two doses. This is mean that there is no severity for the lower dose in this city, in this study, for the higher dose and the in complete uh, retinal vascularizations. So the, through, through, through this study, the ranibizumab got the approval to be used uh, in the 0.2 in Europe uh, for the ROV treatment. But some of you countries like the Switzerland, they give the approval just the 0.1 to avoid any systemic effect and about safety issue because for 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 according to the literature is the 0 0.1 is effective as an uh, an, an 0 0.2 and this is the um, this is the even the extension frame they look after the behavior of these babies after two years they found there's when you use the ranibizumab uh, compared by the laser you have reduced high myopia better vision related to the quality of life and even there is about the behavior, neurodevelopment, they don't found any any uh, difference between the three three groups, uh, the motor function, the health status. So even there is no difference in the um, uh, the measuring of the head, the skull or, or any difference in the body uh, structures. Um, so just to compare between, because for us still we compare between Avastin, uh, Bifazumab, Ranibizumab. When this is a review about the data between the, the literature, which, the studies which was there, according to this, reactivation post anti-VGF related to the aggressive of the ROB. When you have aggressive ROB, you will have re reactivation in spite of use any dose. If you use the anti-VGF in the zone one, the reactivation is higher. Ranibizumab and lower dose, yes, uh, have maybe earlier than the others reactivations. But could this related to the systemic effect of this medication or to, to the intraocular? Still, because when the when we compare between ranibizumab and lower dose of the mesumab, they found that the activations around the same and the same it will be earlier. So it could be for us maybe it could this is the serum effect for this VGF on the patient. We don't know.
Uh, and uh, in the in the last here, I want to mention the Firefly study, which approved the got the the FDA approval for the flibercept to be used in the ROB. And the flibercept here is used in the 20% of adults, 0.4 milligram. Uh, they enter in the the ROB stage two, zone two, with the plus, which was avoided in the Rainbow study. And even according to the investigation here, uh, the higher free and bounded uh, flibercept in the plasma uh, is high compared by the adults who receive in the, in the AMD. Reactivation in the flibercept, 30%. Death rate, uh, the, the death cases was three cases in the flibercept uh, group, but according to the investigator, it was related for the prematurity complication like bronchitis, uh, uh, distress, uh, and it happened between six to eight weeks after the injection. pre serum of a number of the patients continue until eight weeks. So even after that, after they get the approval, they enter the Firefly next, which will be extension for this uh, follow-up more to look after the safety of these medications. Just I want um, to mention the iCROB3. This is the most important maybe uh, paper came for us to the ROB last year. Uh, they mentioned here the re reactivation, which we when we use the anti VEGF is higher, and the peripheral vascular area, which will be higher in the in the if we use the anti VEGF. So uh, according to this uh, Taiwan uh, study, they mentioned they look after the, the patient uh, who received multi medications. They found that the peripheral vascular area could be founded from 20, 50 percent to 100 of the patient who receive. Uh, by the anti -VGF. Then it related maybe to the dose, according to the, uh, which we found it in the rainbow study, or even the medication. So when you use the anti -VGF, you put in mind if the baby, it could have continue a vascular area, you should follow up this. And for that, I think the most important thing when you treat other ROB to put, um, to put the plan, how you are you going, going to look after this patient, uh, where, especially if, the, if you have, um, like Dr. Uh, Arfan mentioned that sometimes the patient come as a visiting uh, patient not is already resident in this uh, in this country. To conclude, it could be that 20% of adult dose, the ideal to use be in the ROB, still we are waiting the, the clear evidence. Earlier retreatment, earlier uh, reactivation, sorry about this, earlier reactivation uh, mostly will, be, will come with the low doses. Uh, systemic, uh, systemic safety for this medication is still under debate. We don't know a real uh, until, because we are waiting still the five years, and we don't know, we can't just say that this is safe until we see a clear evidence for that. Thank you for listening, and uh, if there is any, any question, I am. That's great, Hassan. Thank you very much for uh, such a so it's a great uh, scientific uh, in that it's, it's it's really good to have a look at that. Now uh, I just had a like a comment, you know, because uh, the anti vegfs they came out in two thousand and five. They started with macugen, and then they were using in diabetic macularema. If you remember, Hassan, and then in two thousand and nine, people were people were just using it in uh, in ROP. So. Now, if you if you do the calculation, these kids, whoever are out there, they're like 14 years, years of age. It's been like 14 years. Now, it would be interesting to look at their other end organs. So retina is like an end organ. The blood vessels has an effect. If someone has a look at their, their, their kidneys or probably their heart, probably we may see some kind of thinning and all that stuff. So, you know, the only thing which worries me with the anti-VEGF, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, treatment. It buys you time. And yet it reduces the effect of uh, myopia. And, but I mean, what's going to happen to these kids, you know, with our lifestyle changes, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes, hypertension coming in more? Are these kids of, are these kids developing, are they, are they going to develop strokes at an early age or not? So, uh, so well, and, and, yeah. and again, you know, uh, with the recurrence, thing, you know, so now my, my gold standard is whenever I do the injection, I, I make the laser a part of the treatment. I don't say that, yes, your baby will not need laser. I always include it. I tell them that we're going to do this. After a couple of weeks, we're going to have a look. There will be recurrence and we'll finish off the treatment with the laser. Because if you do the first one, then they get confused. You say, oh, why are you doing it again? What happened again? Yeah, then you have to explain them the whole thing. 
Yeah, this so this is my approach has changed now. Yeah, but for, for us, yes, we know that before when the NTVGF came, there was conflicts. But when you see, compare between the results between the Zone 1 and the Zone 1 aggressive ROB, between the NTVGF and the laser, the superiority of the NTVGF is clear. Visual yeah, action, yeah. Oh, visual I, I, there's no doubt for, about that. You're for, absolutely for us, right. We, we approve that the medication. Now our problem is the dose because the reactivation. <laughs> for me, even before I was, for me, it's, it's holy synthesis. When you do the injection, recurrence laser with any zone. But when we look after patients when who has aggressive ROB, when develop the recurrence after seven weeks, when they will be in the zone one, when you do the laser, the patient end by minus eight, minus seven, minus five, depending on the patient when you do the laser. So we compulsory go for the re-injection in a few cases. And surprisingly, we found that there is babies, we, we re-inject them, they reach the zone three by the vessels. Even if you do the laser for them, it will be less myopia, less yeah. visual acuity. Sure. If you ask me, I yeah. think that I going for lower doses, it could be the solution sometimes yeah. it, for us to avoid the safety. And it will be, then we can have the benefit of this medication. And the, if the patient has recurrence in zone one or zone two, posterior. but if the patient zone two and, and three, I don't even give the choice for the injection directly. I'll go for the laser. We don't discuss yeah. it with the patients. Um, I don't know. I have ju just. I want to avoid to, uh, missing the time. Can you please? We have the lecture from uh, Doctor uh, recorded lecture from Doctor uh, Peter Campbell. Uh, Fatima. Hi, my name is Pete Campbell. I'm an associate professor of ophthalmology in Portland, Oregon, at the Oregon Health Science University. I'm sorry I couldn't be there live, but I'm. Um, uh, I'd like to present to you some of our group's work on artificial intelligence applications in retinopathy prematurity. This slide shows my acknowledgments and disclosures. In terms of acknowledgments, I work with a large group in the IROP Research Consortium, which was started by Michael Chang, um, and uh, really, really privileged to work with this group of people. In terms of disclosures, um, some of the technology that we've developed in terms of AI algorithms and uh, cameras we are trying to bring to the bedside. And so we've started a company, which I'll tell you about later. So there is that conflict of interest to disclose. The history of ROP has changed over the last 100 years. Uh, and uh, to summarize it quite quickly, uh, we've moved from a disease of mild premature babies going blind to only really the most premature babies going blind in most high-income countries. Um, that said, in many regions of the world where neonatal care continues to improve, we continue to have a large problem uh, with oxygen exposure and with advanced ROP causing blindness, even in babies where it should be preventable. Every year, approximately 50,000 babies go blind around the world. Most of those cases could be prevented with timely diagnosis and appropriate treatment. When we talk about ROP blindness prevention, there's three levels of prevention. Primary prevention is reducing the incidence of disease, and that's primarily through improved neonatal care and oxygen monitoring. Secondary prevention is performed through ophthalmic ROP screening, either in person or via telemedicine. And then tertiary prevention is providing uh, appropriate treatment when severe ROP is diagnosed. AI actually has applications uh, at all three levels of prevention that I've talked about before. Today, I'm gonna focus primarily on secondary and tertiary prevention. Secondary prevention, again, is providing timely and accurate ROP screening. And so the question is, can AI be used to improve ROP screening, diagnosis, monitoring, or risk prediction? And what are the potential advantages of AI-based ROP screening? In other words, there are two potential uh, use cases. One is in place of the ophthalmologist or improving the efficiency of the ophthalmologist in regions where there may not be enough providers. And then secondarily, in regions where there are enough providers, are there advantages to providing objective diagnosis uh, you know, by an AI algorithm? I just want to acknowledge that there have been several groups that have worked in this area, and each group has uh, taken a slightly different approach to applying machine learning to ROP diagnosis. Uh, what I'm gonna focus on today is what we call the IROP Deep Learning Vascular Severity Score. And that is, you take an image from a RETCAM or another camera, uh, get a vessel segmentation map, and you output a score from one to nine. Nine represents severe plus disease, one represents very normal and thin vessels. 
It turns out, we've known for a long time that as you develop more peripheral disease, you get more dilation and tortuosity in the posterior pole, as evidenced by this figure from 15 years ago in the UK ROP guidelines. When we looked at 5,000 ROP examinations, we found an association between a, the score provided by a single RETCAM photograph in zone one and the corresponding stage and extent of disease uh, in an eye. As a result, a single photograph providing a single score from one to nine corresponds quite closely to the overall level of ROP in an eye. In other words, it's a surrogate for the overall level of disease. Higher in more posterior zone and higher with more stage and more extent of stage three disease. As a result, because it corresponds to the overall level of disease, as you follow eyes through ROP progression between, say, 30 and 40 weeks postmenstrual age, you see some eyes that progress and develop more stage, more extent of disease, and some eyes that don't progress. In fact, in a typical screening population, approximately 90% of eyes will not develop severe ROP or require treatment. These figures show uh, in two different data sets the idea that we can follow eyes progressing uh, either through the normal course of disease with spontaneous resolution or to the point where they need to be treated. The other thing that we noticed is that eyes that progress towards treatment requiring ROP do so before they need to be treated. That is, even at 32 and 33 weeks, um, eyes that progress and will eventually need treatment look different. That is, they have more dilation and tortuosity than eyes that do not progress towards treatment requiring disease. And so we asked the question, could we use this sign of uh, disease progression to identify progressors from non-progressors with the idea that uh, of creating a risk model that would improve the efficiency of ROP screening? On the right, you see uh, uh, sim symbolized 90% of babies don't require treatment or don't develop severe disease. Could we screen a much smaller pie but identify all of those who develop severe disease and subject babies at low risk to fewer examinations. Work published in the journal Pediatrics by my colleague Aaron Coiner a few years ago demonstrated based on a single examination, so a single photograph at 32 to 33 weeks postmenstrual age and with knowledge of the gestational age, we were able to identify with 100% sensitivity eyes that were not progressing towards treatment requiring disease. That is, we didn't miss any babies who screened negative based on this risk model. In the two populations that we looked at, we've had between 50 and 80% specificity. That is, eyes that screened positive could be followed closely for disease progression. But in concept, uh, the vast majority of eyes could only need to be screened one time and then, um, and then uh, uh, not subjected to further examinations, which reduces the stress to those babies and reduces the workload for the ophthalmologist. We evaluated, evaluated this separately in low middle income countries. So in India, Nepal, and Mongolia, we trained a slightly different risk model, but the same concept, a uh, single point in time, usually at around three weeks of life, uh, identified a photograph and then knowledge of gestational age and developed a new risk model, tested then in three separate populations, and again, did not miss any babies progressing to severe disease. And if, if applied uh, with weekly examinations uh, for positive, exa positive screens, we could reduce by half the number of babies requiring screening in these populations without missing any babies with severe disease. Well, as you know, to do digital-based screening or telemedicine, you need a digital ROP camera. And these can be quite expensive, ranging from 50 to 150,000 US dollars. We recently explored using some of the available smartphone adapters, the MII RETCAM uh, from MII RETCAM made, made in India and the MIO, uh, which is made by Keeler, uh, and trained technicians to take images in the back of baby's eyes. Uh, we then adapted an AI algorithm to uh, to use on these images and showed in this paper published a few uh, months ago that uh, in concept this could work for AI-based ROP screening uh, without an expensive digital fundus camera. So in summary, for secondary prevention, 
we've talked about uh, how AI-assisted ROP screening could improve the efficiency, objectivity, and accuracy of ROP diagnosis, provide an earlier diagnosis of severe ROP, including aggressive posterior ROP, potentially reduce the number of examinations required, including in low-income countries where it's most important. But there's a critical need, which is low-cost cameras. Smartphones may be able to help address that, uh, but I think all of us really want a wide-field, low-cost camera. I'm going to transition now to talk about applications of artificial intelligence algorithms for tertiary prevention, that is, cons uh, providing consistent treatment and identification of complications. One of the most pressing issues in the days of anti-VEGF is identifying eyes that are going to recur or reactivate requiring treatment. There's nothing worse <clears throat> than providing effective treatment primarily and then have an eye go blind, which does happen. These are data published in uh, JAMA Network Open, work with colleagues in Germany. Andreas Stahl was the senior author here. We looked in the CAREOP data set at eyes treated with ranibizumab, who then reactivated. And on the right, you see eyes that uh, were treated initially improved in vascular severity and then reactivated at some time later requiring retreatment. These data were independent of the clinical uh, decision to treat, but the arrows indicate where the clinician decided to treat these babies, suggesting that eyes uh, that are reactivating can be followed with a vascular severity score, and eyes that have a higher vascular severity score at baseline are more likely to reactivate early. So this has important implications for monitoring post-anti-VEGF. There's much more I could say, but in the, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there and just uh, mention that for tertiary uh, prevention, AI-assisted diagnosis could provide objective treatment thresholds and standardized treatment between clinicians. One thing I did not talk about today but is an important problem in ROP is the consistency of treatment uh, given that it's subjective. The second is it can identify treatment failure and reactivation. And in theory, in the future, and I didn't talk much about this today, AI could help us identify uh, the most appropriate timing and or method of treatment to reduce adverse outcomes from ROP. So I'm going to transition now a little bit towards work that's uh, being done in our lab with my colleague Yifan Jian here looking at next generation ROP imaging devices. So on the left is a baby uh, taken, uh, image taken with a RETCAM, and you see by montaging it, you can see uh, both the posterior pole and the peripheral disease, although it does get kind of hard to see it towards the edge of the, of the image. On the right is that same baby taken with an OCT um, uh, camera. So this is an ONFOS OCT image that provides volumetric information and provides enhanced contrast of the vascular avascular junction and the stage lesion seen there. Here are a few other examples. You can see on the left uh, where you can see almost the entire vascularized region within one Dear Fatima one or uh, Soraya, can you just uh, please uh, on the right, uh, you stop the recording the way because uh, we want to take uh, Dr. Mariam with us for the last uh, uh, visualization of the vascular uh, presentation, region, please. And provides volumetric information about uh, the neovascular activity at the stage, Soraya, at the, at the, at the Sh peripheral stage, uh, and in theory can provide uh, OCTA data in the future. And yeah. last, can you, you know, what I'm hoping to work on in the future is if we can adapt a smartphone to provide wide field imaging, that I think would be the holy grail because then uh, not only could we adapt AI algorithms, but we could provide a camera for every NICU uh, in the world to, uh, to improve, um, improve screening coverage. Well, in the last few slides, I'd like to uh, transition away from uh, sort of academic research and focus more on uh, practical barriers to implementation. The first five or so years of my career, I was focused on uh, developing algorithms, developing imaging devices, and demonstrating... Uh, Hello, management. Uh, um, Sorry, yeah, please can you stop this uh, presentation now? Perspective Recording? Really, uh, okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Dr. You for Hassan, that. can you unmute yourself, please? Unmute yourself. Nobody here. Yeah. Okay, now, okay. You, you can't hear me. Let me just uh, welcome Dr. Maryam with us, Dr. Maryam al fikki She is from Cairo and uh, from Egypt, uh, Ayn Shams uh, University Social Consultant. She is a uh, veterinary uh, surgeon and consultant. Dr. Maryam, now just if you can share Hello. your... You can, you can hear me, yeah? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Please, can you just uh, share your presentation with us? Yes, I can. Uh, 
Yes, and I'm so sorry for this uh, inconvenience. <laughs> no problem, no, no problem. We can understand, no problem. So yes, I will be sharing now. Share screen. Uh, no, no, not this one. I'm sorry, not this one. Um, stop share. I'm sorry for this. Yes. Uh, mama. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, I will be speaking about uh, Arubirikans. Uh, so can you hear me? Yes? Yes, we yes, can. We can. yes we can hear you. Uh, so uh, to start uh, and understand uh, what the meaning of Arubirikans, we have to understand what is the regression. So regression of reproductive prematurity post uh, treatment means that the blus regresses and the new vessels or the changes at the periphery also regresses. Like this case with laser, this is the baseline. We have extensive plus. This is after one month, the plus disease is decreasing. The new vessels also here are regressing. And finally, the fibrous tissue completely is separated from the retina. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, you can, can see. Cursor? Can, okay. See. So, uh, this is another case. Again, we have plus disease. We have a very high fibrovascular reach here. And this is after one month, the vessels are not uh, as engorged as before. And you can see that the uh, fibrovascular proliferation uh, regressed and has been separated from the surface of the retina. This is a picture when you are doing uh, an injection. So after injection by one week, you will have uh, the uh, plus disease also uh, regressing as we can see here and then uh, you will have um, progressive regression of plus disease and progressive vascularization of the retina so if you are doing an injection you need the blood vessels to grow further this is the complete regression when the blood vessels uh, reach the uh, periphery of the retina but if you have just regression of the plus and regression of the new vessels which we can see here and they have regressed over the uh, next visits this is uh, incomplete regression complete regression means complete vascularization of the retina so at any time when you don't have complete regression you can have reactivation or recurrence of the pathology. This is uh, another case, again, aggressive posterior tenoctive prematurity as baseline. At one week, plus is regressing, new vessels are disappearing, and then the vessels start to grow until you have near complete vascularization. This is still under observation. So, Reactivation happens more common with laser or with the intravitreal antivegif. No, with the intravitreal antivegif because we have still a vascular retina uh, which can take up to like six or seven months to completely vascularize. So at any time you can have reactivation of the disease. When would you have reactivation after laser? Uh, it will occur within two weeks to one and a half months uh, by maximum. Why? because reactivation with laser happens because of uh, one of two causes, uh, which I will show later, which is either you have skip areas you did not treat. This is why the disease reactivated. So you have still a vascular retina that was missed in the primary treatment. And if you find this in the first follow-up visits and you treat it, usually you would not have this reactivation. The second cause, which is uh, the worst cause, is that the disease can be very posterior, very aggressive, with fibrovascular proliferations, very extensive, that the pathology is, uh, you don't have just a vegify, you have a transforming gross factor beta, so when you give a treatment for the VEGF, which is a laser, it initially regresses and then the transforming gross factor beta will take the upper hand and you will find the retina is detaching. So this is in the very aggressive cases I will show later, not in the very early cases. Usually when you do laser in an early case, uh, like the cases um, very beginning, uh, it will completely regress, it will not reactivate. What about with the intravitreal anti -vegif? If you are giving bevacizumab, the instance of reactivation is variable in the literature between 4 to 
ranibizumab has a higher instance of reactivation, aflipercept is the least. Why? Bifizumab stays in the circulation for a very long time. That is why it will suppress the VEGF for a long duration, uh, decreasing the instance that you will have a reactivation. Ranibizumab, the fastest to disappear from the circulation, and thus you will have a reactivation. Aflipercept uh, um, will, will close multiple VEGF uh, receptors. That's why it has the least instance of reactivation, and uh, it has also a delayed response. So you will have the response maybe after one week or two weeks uh, delayed, but you will have a long-standing response with the uh, aflipercept. If you are giving an intravitreal anti vegf as I said before, at any time you have still a vascular retina, you can have a reactivation. Early reactivation happens between one month after the injection to four months after the injection, while the late reactivation can happen starting from four months up to one year after the injection if you still have a vascular retina. And the postmenstrual age most active period is up to 60 weeks or 70 weeks postmenstrual age. Again, if you have more posterior pathology, instance of reactivation is higher. If you have more avascular retina, the instance of reactivation is higher. Now, let us go to some cases. This is my first case. This is uh, at the baseline. We have plus and we have new vessels. And after one week of the injection, the plus is regressing and the new vessels disappeared. And the last picture is after one month and I have the vessels are growing further away, still avascular, but you have what we call persistent plus. This is different from the other eye of the same patient. I have plus disease, new vessels, ridge is high a little bit. I injected, this is after one week. The plus is regressing and the ridge is, uh, the activation is decreasing. And then again, after one month, I have reactivation of the plus, it is increasing. So the first sign of reactivation or recurrence is that you will have the plus initially regressing and then starting to appear again. So you'll have to keep an eye on this patient. And also we have here new vessels at the old ridges. They are still there appearing, although that the vessels already crossed the ridge and they went to a further point. So you can have reactivation at the old ridge or you can have reactivation at the new ridge. This eye was injected and it went fine. This is the second case, an aggressive posterior ROP at the baseline, extensive ischemia. After injection, it went fine. And then after seven weeks from the injection, I have re plus again. And we have those small tufts of new vessels, which are like popcorns, but they actually are, they are very red. So I decided to re-inject. And then it went fine. And again, after two months, I have again recurrence of the plus. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I want to do this. And I have uh, new vessels here uh, over uh, this area. And at this time, I had again to re-inject. So this eye was injected twice. And then uh, after like when it reached 70 weeks or 60 weeks postmenstrual age, I still have a vascular retina. I decided to go for laser and then I found this. There was a still new vessels at this point, which I would call a late reactivation. Uh, this was actually not a new plus. It was a persistent plus. She always had a plus. When you have an extensive plus at the baseline, usually it stays and we call it a persistent plus. This is my third case. This is a very interesting case. I have a bilateral aggressive posterior ROP at the baseline. So I injected, and this is the picture of the case after one month from the injection. I have the plus regressed OU, but still the avascular retina is extensive. Only thing happened that the plus disease regressed and the new vessels disappeared, but there's no vascularization whatsoever for up to one month. So another month later, I followed up the case and I follow up weekly actually, but this, I take pictures when I have changes. I find that uh, the plus disease started to reappear again. And actually in the right eye, I started to have here new vessels, as you can see. So I injected this one. This one had plus, but no new vessels. So it's not yet indicated for injection. So I followed up the other eye. And this is the picture after one week, the right eye completely regressed. And now I have, well, full blown picture of new vessels in the other eye, which is now for injection. And you can see that the plus also increased. Again, after, uh, I think uh, that was, um, sorry. Uh, so one week later, I have the regression in both eyes and everything is stable. And two months later, I still have reactivation, but in the form only of plus, I don't have actual new vessels, just small popcorn lesions. I decided to follow up weekly until after 
another month later, I have vascularization going further away. This area is query for me. I didn't know if this is new vessels or not, but the other eye is completely quiet. So I did a fluorescein. Yes, the left eye is completely quiet. The right eye have just those uh, pinpoint lesions, or maybe they are small new vessels. So I just decided to follow up this case. And this is a picture after one month of a follow-up. And I have a stable picture in the right and the left eye slightly increasing these uh, areas. And I'm planning to do a laser for this case because now we reached like 62 weeks and it's not vascularizing. So I'm planning to laser the rest. Uh, this is another case. Uh, we have this picture at the baseline, aggressive posterior ROP and a ridge 360 degrees vascularized, I injected, and then this is the picture after one week plus regressed, and the new vessels are regressing, so now we are doing fine. After two weeks, I have this contraction of the fibrous tissue, which some of them either call it crunch or call this reactivation in the fibrous component. So I, we decided to do a vitrectomy, and this is the picture two weeks uh, post-lens sparing vitrectomy and two months post-lens sparing vitrectomy, and the traction is uh, regressing. Uh, I think this is my last case. Uh, it's a case uh, that was done outside, again, aggressive posterior ROP, extensive plus, and you have this fibrovascular proliferation 360 degrees around the central area. And the doctor who did him, he did him a very good laser uh, over all the ischemic retina, no skip lesions. And then he had initial regression. He did not uh, take photos of the initial regression after one week, but after three weeks, the patient presented with this picture, extensive uh, recurrence of the plus disease and the fibrous component contracted, which we call it a crunch uh, phenomena. And we did him again a lens pairing vitrectomy. He initially went fine, and again he recrunched after two weeks. So this is to summarize uh, the idea of the reactivation. When you have a case that you did an injection or laser initially, and then uh, you have an improvement of the picture, you will keep following up this case. I do the follow up weekly until the vessels pass the mid zone two, and then I can start to increase the follow up periods to 10 days and two weeks until we reach zone three. So this is the first part. This uh, actually, uh, this algorithm I got from, uh, a paper which is making a very good summary for how to manage those cases. So this is not mine. Uh, the second uh, idea is you have an initial regression, the blood vessels, new vessels regressed and the plus disease regressed, and then you have a reactivation. Reactivation also is, will start with a new plus disease. So you have a new plus disease developing. Uh, you will uh, check the case. Either you have new vessels, just new vessels, and you don't have traction on the retina, so you can just re-inject the injection was mentioned in the literature up to four times. I have cases I injected four times. That was my maximum. But there is one paper that mentioned that they re-injected the same case like nine times, which is too much. And I will say why. Uh, or either, uh, so it, either it will go well after the re-injection or you will find it worsening or the, you will have attraction or something like this. So you will have to go for vitrectomy. But if you have the reactivation, as I said, showed in the last images, in the form of attraction on the retina, then you have to go for a vitrectomy. You cannot go for reinjection again. So you will go for a vitrectomy. What if you uh, did a laser? If you did a laser for a case and uh, you, you find that it is not completely regressing, first you have to check in the first follow-up visit that you don't have skip areas. If you have skip areas, you have to enter the patient again within this two to three days and do those skip areas or, or you will have a reactivation uh, or maybe no, re no complete regression. The second, if you have initial traction as you uh, saw in my previous cases that you have after the laser attraction, you have to go for a vitrectomy. You don't wait or the traction will cut the uh, laser marks. So let us go back to why I don't like injecting a lot or why the cases which we inject a lot will not do well because injection every time delays the vascularization of the retina. So you will always have a persistent vascular retina. So if you are injecting a case one time, two and three times, and then you, uh, you just passed uh, like mid zone two or something like that, you can laser the rest because if you keep injecting, you, okay, you will have 
uh, settlement of the disease activity, but you have a persistent avascular retina that you will initially laser. So you should go just for laser now, not keep injecting and then go for laser later because it will not vascularize from the repeat in injection. Thank you. So this is uh, the final of my uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Maryam, for a uh, valuable and excellent uh, presentation. There is one question, which medication you are using in uh, generally in the, your uh, practice? Avastin or uh, Rambizuma, which medication you use for the individual? So, um, when I started doing the ROP, uh, we had uh, the Avastin abandoned already in Egypt uh, because of a bout of endophthalmitis. So, I did not uh, try Avastin except once. Uh, it's 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 tremendous. It actually causes a very uh, instantaneous effect, and in a very um, and it will stay for a long duration. Uh, what I'm used to, to use now okay. is the ranibizumab. The yeah. ranibizumab is um, the effect may be a little bit delayed, so it will appear within two days, maximum one week in some cases. Uh, and usually they have a higher rate of recurrence. Uh, I did not try aflipercept actually. But about the dots, generally, which dots you use for the for I use the, the half adult dose, half the adult dose. Because, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, for maybe for in the previous presentation, we said that now the trend in the using for the anti VGF not go for uh, prolonged exposure for the serum VGF suppression, it's for less like the in the flipper they use the 20% of the adults and then. And ranibizumab, they use around the 20 or the 40. And the problem with the bifazumab, they have uh, to go even for lower doses for to avoid any systemic effect for the medication. So I, I tried once to lower the dose, and actually uh, I had no regression of the disease after one week. So maybe I'm a little bit afraid to, to lower the dose, but I, I have a a colleague who does this, uh, Dr. Ahmed Abdelhead here, he does uh, the Afri Percept, uh, the 25% uh, of uh, the other dose actually. And he says it's good. But uh, maybe my experience was not so good. It was an aggressive ROP case and I injected and after one week I found no response. So I entered again and re-injected and I did not try it again. Hmm. Because according to the Firefly, they use it 20% and the recurrence are around 30%. But before they use the half dose, one, one milligram, and this is maybe it will be huge for the babies for the so as the Avastin when they use 625, they found the recurrence is less. But when they go for the lower, for to avoid the systemic effect, they found the reactivation has become earlier from that. And depending yeah. on the zone which they they, they use in the patient. And um, in the end, I want to thank uh, all the our uh, respectable speakers for the presentations. And uh, I think now we have another have another uh, symposium in this hall. I want to thank okay. uh, Dr. Alfan for, uh, for you, presentation, Dr. Mariam, to be with us. Thank you, Dr. Mariam. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mariam. Thank you. Thank you.